Here's what we came up with. All right, you'll get another chance to try your hand at it in a bit. For now, let's look at the second issue in formatting histograms. Issue number two, reference points and tick marks. In either type of histogram, figuring out what scale to use on the axis and how to space the tick marks up the vertical axis can be tricky. Rest assured that if you're ever creating a histogram in a real life situation, you'll probably be using software that will figure all of that out for you automatically. And if you did have to create one by hand, you'd probably be able to use some graph paper to make things easier. For now, we're only going to give some simple guidelines to eliminate a few problems someone might see. Let's look at this data set we've already seen. The table comes from a local hair salon and beauty supply shop, and it divides up the shop's clients by the number of times they come in for a haircut each year. We can make a frequency histogram of this data right now simply by putting the category interval boundaries 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16 across the bottom of the horizontal axis and creating tick marks on the vertical axis that are spaced regularly and go at least as high as our highest frequency, which is 146. The following are two examples of how we might do this. Depending upon what our data looks like, we might want to use one of these more than the other, but we won't worry about that right now. Instead, all we have to do is quickly draw some bars on the graph at the correct heights shown by the haircut data set. For a histogram, the sides of the bars touch, instead of being freestanding like they are in a bar graph. So depending upon either set of axis we used, we'd get something like this. Let's take a look at both of these charts for a bit. Notice how choosing different reference points for the vertical axis slightly changes the height of the bars. The pictures of the two graphs are the same size, but because the axis on the right reaches to a higher value, it forces the bars of the histogram to not reach as high as they do on the left. If the axis on the right had reached up to 200 instead of 175, this would have made the bars in the histogram even shorter. In fact, it's possible to choose tick mark values that make the bars look very stretched out or very similar, which is one way to make histograms hard to read or even misleading. We'll look at that later though. For now, both of these frequency histograms look good enough to read them clearly. Just some final notes on tick marks. When choosing how many tick marks to put on the vertical axis, there is no right or wrong answer. You may not choose the same reference point someone else would, and your histogram will still work and look good. What's important is the numbers listed show regularly spaced distances, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on on a ruler, and that there isn't too many of them or too few. Regarding what numbers to use, think of how people tend to count in multiples, something like 10s, 20s, 25s, or 100s. This works even for smaller numbers like the percentage values that are shown in a density histogram, like multiples of tenths or hundredths. Regarding how many tick marks should be included, a good rule of thumb is that the viewer should be able to look at any labeled bar height and tell about what it is even if the label isn't written above it. Not enough tick marks makes eyeballing it difficult because the viewer isn't able to visually break up the blank space, and too many tick marks makes eyeballing it difficult because the viewer's eye gets lost in the tick marks when trying to reference the axis. Let's look at the following histograms. These histograms are examples of how not to do it. The first one has few two tick marks, and the second one has too many. With this in mind, you're ready to try your hand at formatting some frequency and density histograms on your own.